Hello, hello, welcome to a fresh episode of Boca with Moise. In this episode, I speak to Khadija Akhtar, who is a visual artist. We talk about her creative process. We talk about balancing a creative instinct with the instinct to sell and make a product more marketable. We talk about how artists often channel their trauma into their work and lots more. Khadija, what's up? Well, um, I had a very tiring day because okay. I'm finally on a break. Mm-hmm. And I've graduated two years ago mm-hmm. now, but since I graduated since the day, I haven't stopped working mm-hmm. and I've been literally working like it's been my thesis. And we also know you have an exhibition starting today, right? Yeah. And where is that? So this exhibition is happening in Islamabad mm-hmm. and it's called The Winners. Mm-hmm. So the thing with art is um, there are different opportunities for artists, there are residencies, mm-hmm. there are exhibitions, then you can also apply for awards. So I applied for an award in 2021 yeah. and it was called the Arjuman Painting Award. Mm-hmm. It's a very prestigious award over here and it's with Gallery Sex, which mm-hmm. is in Islamabad. So the people who have won that award in the past four years, the first, uh, the first, mm-hmm. uh, first, second and third prize winners, mm-hmm. they get offered to be a part of this show, okay. dedicated mm-hmm. to them and it's called the winner. So, so people who, yeah. can, who, who want to buy your art can go to Gallery 6 right now and buy it. And how long, when does the exhibition end? It just started today and it's for a week. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So good luck with the exhibition, firstly. But I'm really curious because, you know, when people are, when you're 10 or 12 and somebody asks you, what will you do when you grow up? Art isn't something that most people choose, right? So were you always inclined towards art? Was the yeah. Rest? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically, um, growing up, um, all my friends knew I would be an artist. Mm-hmm. And even um, me, like whenever anyone would ask me, I would, they were like, what do you want to be? I'm like, an artist, artist all the time. It was an artist. And the first memory I recall um, was with my mom. It's all because of her, by the yeah. way. Like what I am today, it's all because of her because she's a self-taught artist. Okay. Mm. And I had these memories. So it was in the genes. Maybe. I, yeah. I still don't know if, like, you know, it's debatable whether art is mm-hmm. learned or whether it's, like, inherited. Mm-hmm. But I think a part of it could possibly yeah. be inherited because it's it passed on to my sister mm-hmm. and I as well. But I have these memories of us sitting on our bed together, me, my mom and my sister with those art pads and crayons. Mm-hmm. And all night we would just be drawing. And my mother told me this instance when I was literally a baby, when mm-hmm. I just started walking. She'd give me and my sister, like, a bunch of things. Mm-hmm. And on an empty table, she'd be like, just, you know, put these things on the table. And she'd notice how me and my sister would just put the things on the table. And she's she just looked and she's like, you know, there's, there's something going on mm-hmm. here. You arrange these things so brilliantly. Mm-hmm. And that's the first time she realized, you know, we have some artistic inclination. And I don't remember this at all. But she would like, you know, test us in these different ways. And also growing up, naturally, I just... I don't know if it's a thing like people say left-handed people are more artistic. Yeah. But I just I also were intelligent apparently. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, me and my sister both like we just naturally started mm-hmm. doing everything with our left hand. I use my right hand too for different things. Mm-hmm. So like I'm ambidextrous, but I draw with my right hand and with my left hand I paint. Okay. So yeah. And your sister's also an artist. Yeah. Okay. So it it does run in the family then. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. yeah. And then you, what school were you in? I was in Karachi Grammar School <laughs> since 2000 to 2015. So from the beginning yeah. till the end. And then you went to Indus Valley. Indus Valley. So how was yeah. that experience? Right? Because a lot of people that I've seen who want to go into art, there's also a question that do you go to Indus Valley, do you go to NCA? And Indus Valley is obviously in Karachi, perhaps the best art school we have. But NCA has been there for a longer time as well, right? Yeah. So did you also have that confusion? And do you, how was your experience at Indus Valley? So, do you think it helped? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, the thing is with me, um, I didn't have like any choice because I was adamant that I was going to go into business. Okay. And I was like, you know, art is my talent. And, you know, I like doing art. Mm-hmm. It's my passion. And everyone knew me as the art girl in yeah. grammar school. So, but the thing with me was that I was like, no, I want to do business. I want to, you know, be in in marketing or Mm -hmm. something. Maybe art is not for me. Like, I don't know how Mm -hmm. art would be like 
done in practical life. Also, just to interject, I think with art, there's also less of a structure, right? So with with yeah. degree in marketing, you have a career path that's pretty clear. It's like with monthly art, monthly income, yeah. monthly income, and it's like you know the growth is also mm-hmm. like very like you know structured. There's no structure in art. Yeah. But back then, I was like a kid, and mm-hmm. no one really educated me on how you can make a living through mm-hmm. art. So I just had this idea. I'm like, I need a nine to five job to make mm-hmm. money, and I don't know how I would do that if I would pursue art. Yeah. So I wasn't sure what I was going to do, mm-hmm. but I was planning on going into business, and I remember. um i made my decision all my friends were ready to go to university mm-hmm. and this was like towards the end of the year and then i suddenly had a panic attack yeah. and i had the worst panic attack and the first panic attack of my life and i told my parents i'm like what am i doing with my life i can't mm-hmm. do business i want to do what i love doing and that should be art mm-hmm. and then my parents just looked at me and they laughed at me and they were like yeah we were literally waiting for you mm-hmm. to say this and waiting yeah. for, for you to like you know admit all of this and realize yourself mm-hmm. we're not going to push you for it so when i realized that i was like okay now university starting mm-hmm. in literally like a couple of months yeah. where do i apply because i need to do art i am mm-hmm. not going to waste any yeah. more time i'm not taking a gap year to decide whether i'm going into business or not i'm just going to go into art and that's it mm-hmm. so i was like okay what options do i have and for nca you have to make a portfolio i did yeah. not have the time mm-hmm. and then i saw indus valley like my sister went mm-hmm. to indus valley as well so i saw and it said you have exactly a week left mm-hmm. for the applications and this is when i turned 18 i yeah. had to get my c and i c made mm-hmm. i had to get something signed by some some 12th grade officer or some grade oh. officer yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. it's like you have to do all these different mm-hmm. things and i was like okay this is all this is the option i have i'm going to apply to mm-hmm. indus because i have to do art i'm not mm-hmm. not going to do it and i made up my mind so for a whole week we were running around the city mm-hmm. I filled in all my forms. I got my C and I C made, and I was the last person to apply f- to Indus. Okay. And I remember it was the day they were just about to close the mm-hmm. office, and I ran with the paper, and I literally ran and I went to the administration office, mm-hmm. and I'm like, I'm applying, and then they just looked at me and they're like, What happened to you? You're late, and I'm like, I'm sorry, this was a last minute mm-hmm. decision, but that decision turned out to be the best decision mm-hmm. of my life. So yeah, I went to Indus Valley from Gramo. and it was a huge change because in gramo people are very much like everyone's the same yeah and then you know when you decide to study it's a bubble of sorts yeah, yeah. it is mm-hmm. it is and everyone was like me mm-hmm. like everyone was the same similar interests similar lifestyle mm-hmm. similar mindset and then when i went to indus i like you know it was such a sudden decision for the first year i was just in shock i'm mm-hmm. like oh my god i did this what have i done yeah what am i going to do mm-hmm. like and you know i i instantly felt like i was out of place mm-hmm. and a lot of the students like reminded me as well like mm-hmm. after they found out i was from grammar as well like they i was constantly reminded mm-hmm. that you know i don't fit in mm-hmm. and i didn't really have any friends especially in found- foundation year everyone mm-hmm. started making friends mm-hmm. and i was the one who was kind of left out but eventually like you know i was trying to find my place mm-hmm. i made a few friends here and there but it was always like you know for your first year of university you need to be excited yeah. you know you make friends it's a new chapter in your life but with me i was a very anxious person mm-hmm. i became a very anxious person that i wasn't used to so much change mm-hmm. so i would always like at 4 o'clock our class would be over mm-hmm. i'd be standing outside in the swally frantically calling my yeah. mom saying where are you where are you where are you i want to go home i want to go home mm-hmm. so it it wasn't like the best in the mm-hmm. beginning like it was a rocky start and it's like i was i was not given a chance mm-hmm. by a lot of people mm-hmm. but then later on as i grew into it i made mm-hmm. my work my focus and then i found i made a few mm-hmm. friends who i actually like you know related with yeah. and who i could connect with two people Mm-hmm. and those two people really helped me get through so yeah. that it worked in my favor i think that's also a critique of most uh, educational institutions in pakistan because after your a level there's a major transition to go into university yeah. and a lot of people suffer from anxiety they suffer from de- depression they're unable to really you know uh, adjust do you do you think there was any adequate uh, understanding on the university's part that people may have those challenges and perhaps an effort to address those challenges Yeah, I mm-hmm. it was mainly like not the administration, it was mainly my teachers yeah. because you know, I was bullied a lot. Mm-hmm. 
and with the constant reminder that oh you know you don't belong here mm. what are you doing here who are you the constant like curiosity yeah. about me mm. because i kept my life very private yeah so um i didn't have any friends i, mm. I used to spend my breaks in the bathroom alone yeah. and just like those movies like mm. i never thought yeah. i would be one of mm. those people but i just had no one mm. and this was also after the death of my best friend mm. who i lost um literally in my foundation year she was with me in grammar okay. and after losing her i just became very angry at the mm. world and i was like you know people just come and go and mm. why me why did mm. this happen to me so there was a lot of anger as well so i just kind of gave up on people mm -hmm. that's when i had no one and that's also when i would sit in class alone everyone would go for their breaks mm -hmm. but like my teachers would always be there yeah so eventually like i started talking to my teachers mm -hmm. and then i realized they were my friends mm -hmm. and they really helped me through everything mm -hmm. if it wasn't for my teachers i would have like dropped out mm -hmm. which i was planning on in my third year mm -hmm. like it reached to such a terrible mm -hmm. breaking point that i was like i can't cope anymore and i was a driven student i had good grades but i just couldn't even get out of bed mm -hmm. and it was the bullying the depression the anxiety i gained a lot of weight because i mm -hmm. went to uh, went towards unhealthy coping mm -hmm. mechanisms so i suffered a lot and i had a lot of anger inside me which i didn't understand mm -hmm. so i was ready to drop out and i went to the office i had to sign the papers mm -hmm. and literally in that moment like my head of department at the time she was like please don't go hold on to the one mm. good thing you have even if your life is not going well things ups and downs happen mm -hmm. but you should hold on to that one spark you have and that is art yeah and this is something she told me and i even called my dad like mm -hmm. we had a meeting with my dad me and the head of department and they were telling me you know you should stay you'll be making a mistake if you mm -hmm. leave and then in that moment i just thought and i was sitting with the papers and i just had to write my signature mm -hmm. but last minute i don't know what happened i'm just like i'm not going to sign it yeah. today i'm not going to mm -hmm. sign it and then i walked out and then i bumped into who's the girl who's now like my closest friend mm -hmm. from india yeah. so i bumped into her and i just told her it just came out naturally i'm like i'm not leaving mm -hmm. and then she looked at me she's like what you're not leaving really mm -hmm. and she's like well, how come and i'm just like i don't know mm -hmm. and i was terrified because i was yeah. really excited to leave mm -hmm. because i needed a break mm -hmm. and but all of a sudden just knowing that you know you're suddenly coming back mm -hmm. into thesis year that was like a huge load but mm -hmm. i just didn't know why it happened i just let it happen so after that um i got sick and i was bedridden for a month mm -hmm. and i came back to university and they were very understanding they gave me an extension because they said your record is very good mm -hmm. so we're not going to make you repeat you were ill mm -hmm. so we you are on leave so in my thesis year, i had to make up for my third year okay so it's mm -hmm. like the pressure of thesis on top of that the mm -hmm. pressure of third year mm -hmm. so when i was in my thesis year i finished my third year i and thesis year is your last year yeah okay yeah. that's when you like you know find out who you are as an mm -hmm. artist and what you know is the foundation of your career mm -hmm. then what like you know when you when you're ready to fly it's like mm -hmm. this is the foundation mm -hmm. of it so i did my third year and my thesis here alongside mm -hmm. my thesis yeah. and i was like i made a promise to myself like look i made this decision mm -hmm. and when i make a decision i'll stick to it mm -hmm. and i'm just going to be very sincere mm -hmm. with my thesis so that's when i decided to do my thesis on depression especially okay. my mm -hmm. own personal experience just so mm -hmm. i can find the answers to myself mm -hmm. and why i am a certain way and at the same time also try to heal so it wasn't just doing like a thesis mm -hmm. or building like my own mm -hmm. career or whatever or my own style it was more than that i was just trying to discover who i was and trying to get better mm -hmm. because i see the world in an optimistic way mm -hmm. and it took me a while therapy taught me that it took me a while to see that but i was like no i'm going to do my work based on something dark but mm -hmm. i want to show the good side of it while being realistic yeah. so that's why with my paintings you can see there are a lot of bright colors it's very busy mm -hmm. it can be very overwhelming in terms of happiness but mm -hmm. also it can be like you know people look at my work and they also say oh it's giving me anxiety there's so much going on yeah. and you keep looking you keep finding new things mm -hmm. different meanings so it's like you know my work is basically me on a canvas mm -hmm. and it's my places of comfort mm -hmm. and i find comfort in these crowded spaces yeah. these dream like places and these are all places that exist mm -hmm. so in these places they're like 
places from my dreams, mm-hmm. my childhood, places where I see myself mm-hmm. in the future, or places I frequently visit, like my bedroom. Yeah. So it could be anything, and it's like even mm-hmm. a mixture of a bunch of places. Yeah. So yeah, all the symbolism of these places, they're not exactly how they are. Mm-hmm. Like if you see my paintings, it's like you wouldn't see this as a realistic place. Mm-hmm. So I show them how they make me feel. And these are like my happy places, yeah. my safe places. And it's also showing like, you know, there's a dark undertone mm-hmm. that, okay, you know, life goes by really fast. That's why everything mm-hmm. is so like rushed. There's so much detail. Mm-hmm. There's so many um, thick strokes. And it looks like, you know, it's painted really fast. Yeah. So I'm just showing how time, you know, in that perfect moment of joy, I'm trying to immortalize that mm-hmm. by showing these strokes, the textures, the colors. But I'm also being realistic, showing that time is fleeting mm-hmm. and that it just keeps going. Mm-hmm. So it's like this moment is there, but then it's gone. But then what's your next moment? What do you make out of it? Yeah. I I was looking at your paintings and I realized that there's also a lot that, uh, there's also a lot of symbolism for reunion, right? So in one of your paintings, for example, uh, the door is left open and you know you could you could sense that perhaps the door is open because somebody is left or the door is open because you know you're still waiting for somebody to come so do you think that reunion and separation also feature greatly in your paintings oh definitely Mm -hmm. because um with my experiences with trauma and healing from trauma Mm -hmm. like it's still like it's an ongoing process even though i've i would say that i've healed like there are times when you feel like you know you're falling again But it's like, you know, coming and going just with time, with people, with Mm -hmm. animals. Like, you know, I'm sitting here right now and this is like a moment where I'm talking to you. So I can imagine this moment being painted, but Mm -hmm. then it's like what happens after. So it's like everything is constantly shifting. Life is constantly Mm -hmm. shifting. That's why I'm trying to just show that through my work Mm -hmm. that 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 it's like, you know, it's a still place mm-hmm. because it's in a frame yeah. and you've painted it. But what it happens after that, mm-hmm. it's constantly changing. So it's like every time you look back at my work, you'll find something new because it's like, you know, when you go back to your memories, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, I remember this person. And then I remember something different and how memories morph and mm-hmm. stuff. So it's like I really try to make these things mm-hmm. as ambiguous as I can. And I mm-hmm. leave it up to the person. Yeah. Like even you said, it's like uh, people coming, and going or things shifting. Mm-hmm. It's like, I just let anyone make their own assumption yeah. about my work. I leave it open-ended. Mm-hmm. Like, I know what it means to me, yeah. but I'm interested to know what it means to other people. Mm-hmm. And I, was, I, was, I asked you this question before we, the kind of the rolling as well, that uh, is there a particular genre that your work subscribes to? And I, I said that I thought it's phobism. Yeah. And you said it's partly phobism, but other genres as well. So how do you categorize your work? That's that's like the thing. It's, it's such a difficult question because mm-hmm. I think my style is very like strange Mm. it's very different also there are a lot of colors it's a mixture like if you say if i had to choose it would be a mixture of phobism because of the colors Mm -hmm. it would be a lot of expressionism there would be abstraction there's some like a little bit of realism it depends on how Mm -hmm. you look at it and how you see it but i just feel like it's just an amalgamation Mm -hmm. of a lot of things and Mm -hmm. yeah but mostly it would be phobism and expressionism because of the strokes and because Mm -hmm. of the colors and we were having this conversation that for a number of young artists, especially, plagiarism is a huge problem. Yeah. And uh, your work, for instance, is very detailed. So it's also very difficult to plagiarize your work. So was that also a conscious attempt? Nothing was conscious. Okay. So um, in your thesis, you're basically taught um, you have to come up with an idea. Mm-hmm. And this idea is like something very personal to you where you can be sincere. Mm-hmm. And that's literally the only way you can actually do anything in life is just to be sincere especially with art yeah and if it's like something that you really deeply resonate Mm -hmm. with you pitch the idea to your thesis advisors and they're like okay now start doing research start exploring Mm -hmm. see inspirations build your ideas Mm -hmm. but then make it your own Mm -hmm. like obviously take inspiration but make it your own Mm -hmm. and they wouldn't focus on that enough like constantly we would Mm -hmm. it was drilled in our head you need to make something which is your own yeah. and whether it's the colors the textures anything so as you keep going on in thesis like a lot of people like um when you would plagiarize like you're instantly caught because yeah. obviously our teachers they know mm. art so well they know all the artists yeah. like they're trained mm. and you can't be sincere if you just copy someone mm. You have to, even if you're like doing like a rendition of like Starry Night, like you can make it your own. Mm. 
like because yeah. what makes it you if you're making someone else's work then it's not you exactly, so what's yeah. the point so mm. that's something i believe but all in all art schools mm-hmm. it's always like constantly taught do not plagiarize make it your own and for me personally like i that's what i did mm. so yeah and are there any inspirations uh, you have because your work is also very distinct yeah. and there are certain artists that if you look at their work you can always tell it's theirs yeah. without even even if you don't know the artist's name you can tell whose painting this is so were there any inspirations throughout the journey yeah so um when i did my thesis mm-hmm. my inspiration was van gogh okay and yeah. it was also gogan mm-hmm. and it was these two artists in particular like mm-hmm. i know they're very like well known artists mm-hmm. but uh, the reason i took inspiration from them is because they went through depression as yeah. well and the way they took their trauma and brought it into their work and made it so evocative mm-hmm. really inspired me so mm-hmm. i was like you know you can just see like this person's painting amongst like thousands of paintings yeah. i mean you just see that painting it's like you know it's that person's exactly. painting yeah. mm-hmm. and that's something that you know i wanted to achieve mm-hmm. i wanted to achieve my own my own uh, colors my own textures like my own sense of style with mm-hmm. my work it's like my identity but yeah. on a canvas and i wanted like my aim in life is you know when you see so many paintings mm-hmm. i just want someone to notice that oh that one's kadija's painting yeah. mm-hmm. so you know that's that's how i was inspired and even the use of colors mm-hmm. and all these different things mm-hmm. um uh, a pakistani artist i was telling you off camera yes. as well salman tour mm-hmm. he has achieved this so brilliantly mm-hmm. like the way he uses his colors the way his textures are so bold i'm just i just love it yeah. the fact like i just love color and texture mm-hmm. a lot mm-hmm. and especially in my work like i just it's just something mm-hmm. that makes me feel happy mm-hmm. so if i feel something when i see these people's paintings and it's like you know something i want others to feel like you know when i'm like long mm-hmm. gone and stuff yeah. so yeah and one aspect that we discussed earlier is why well, that you know there are so there are some artists whose work is really good but you also see that they perhaps don't really appreciate the importance of their own work but artists who have done really well people like Salman Tu for instance are not only good artists but they're also smart entrepreneurs so they understand uh, where to sell their paintings they understand how much to sell how much to produce mm. so do you at times feel that it's difficult as an artist to balance your creative instincts with this you know instinct to uh, do good business as well Okay so the one thing um we want taught in art school is how to you know use it in like practical life yeah. like how to price our work hmm. how to market uh, yourself perhaps yeah market yeah. yourself like we were always like the one thing we were taught how to do was to talk and in our thesis it's like hmm. every week we had a jury and it was called a crit yes. short for critique hmm. so they would come up to us and they'd be like okay explain your work back it up hmm. like we'll ask you like lots of questions yeah. and you need to like you know hmm. stand up to your work and that taught me personally mm-hmm. like how i can speak about my mm-hmm. work because obviously if it's me it comes with the job like there'll be people who love it there'll yeah. be people who hate it but you need to know like mm-hmm. where you stand and you should be able to defend your work yeah. at all costs well looking at how this podcast is going i would say that the critics did a good job <laughs> uh, i guess so. yeah. i'm sorry i get really awkward <laughs> with these things but yeah i guess so mm-hmm. um so what indus taught me like i'm just speaking with my own personal mm-hmm. experience i can't really speak for everyone else but i just learned how to talk about my work and you know it's like the artist they paint the work but it's also just as important to put your idea out there mm-hmm. and make other people know because if there's just like a really pretty painting people will have questions maybe they'll make their own answers mm-hmm. out of it but they should also know like what was going on in the yeah. artist's mind because the artist the creator of the painting yeah. is just as important as mm-hmm. the painting and then when you refine your own thoughts it also helps refine your work right oh definitely yeah because yeah. there's more clarity into your work as well yeah, yeah. and as life keeps changing then mm-hmm. your work changes with you yeah. it doesn't stay stagnant so mm-hmm. it's literally like that's the thing with art it's so mm-hmm. it's so strange it, yeah. it's it's like you like your like another part of you that's just like growing mm-hmm. with you and follows you yeah. and it's the best but yeah and this taught me how to talk how to um defend my work how to explain my work mm-hmm. to different people and you know how to put my ideas out in a certain way mm-hmm. and um but they never taught us how to price our work and how to work with galleries mm-hmm. and all these things they just left that up to us yeah so for me personally um 
and for everyone obviously like in thesis like you have a thesis show at the end and that's mm-hmm. when people buy your work yeah. and that's when you make contacts mm-hmm. galleries approach you yeah. they take your numbers and people ask you for commissions mm-hmm. and stuff and like this that. is also uh, one an award at indus right I got a distinction yeah. at Indus, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. and I was put on the dean's list mm-hmm. for my thesis. Yeah. So, um, so what happened was that on your thesis day, mm-hmm. all these like big art people yeah. and just people who are interested in collecting or even just mm-hmm. normal admirers of art, they come, and it's like it gives you a platform mm-hmm. to start your life. Yeah. And trust me, it's like a lot of people like actually like tell you like you know you should do this. Mm-hmm. They give you advice. They offer you shows, stuff like that. So then it's like up to you how you mm-hmm. progress with your prices. You have to take advice from like for me, I took advice from the gallery owners I work yeah. with. I took advice from my teachers because they've already been through it. Mm-hmm. And it's like how do I increase the price? Like look at inflation mm-hmm. also. Yeah. You have to take these things into consideration, True. which yeah. I never did. Mm-hmm. So through the advice of my teachers mm-hmm. and the gallery owners and my sister who's mm-hmm. also an artist four years older than me mm-hmm. it's like you know i learned how to just go step by step mm-hmm. and take certain moves and make sorry make certain moves mm-hmm. that would help my career rather than harm it because mm-hmm. it's like said like things like if you increase your prices a lot within yeah. a year then people will not by your work yeah. you need to like you know go story is just like a normal job like mm-hmm. every year or every couple of years you get promoted or if you do a really big show or mm-hmm. if you win an award or if you do a residency yeah. then obviously like you know your cv will keep filling up True. and then mm-hmm. your work like you know it keeps going up like mm-hmm. that so it's kind of similar but it's a little the process is a bit more organic it's not as structured yeah but it's only with the advice of you know the more experienced artists mm-hmm. who are my teachers and the gallery owners i i know all this stuff yeah and you were having this conversation before the canvas as well that uh, you're very infant in the profession because you graduated you know almost 2 years ago and is there uh, we're starting a new year right now are there any specific plans for this year something that you know you would want to improve with a certain craft that you want to learn or you know any any plans uh, with respect to your work So um the way I personally plan my years is like a year in advance so okay, in like 2021 yeah. mm-hmm. I'm like okay by the end of 2021 I want to have my whole schedule for 2022 mm-hmm. set so I know what I'm yeah. doing and even if I don't have anything to do I would constantly keep making work yeah. like no matter what that's mm-hmm. like my rule for life even yeah. if there's nothing to do I will keep painting mm-hmm. because I will it'll it'll just open more doors and yeah. it's like you know you need to constantly work yeah. otherwise you it's like if i don't constantly work mm-hmm. also i get very anxious yeah. <laughs> so it's like yeah. i just have to but uh this year i i have some shows mm-hmm. planned and they're really exciting i want to apply for some things as well i okay. can't really yeah. say right now but um it's exciting mm-hmm. and it's also um Last year my goal was to explore more with um uh, different sizes mm-hmm. because I would always make really big paintings. Okay. So I was like okay my goal for last year was you know try making like you know different sizes and see mm-hmm. you know explore that. Yeah. I can always learn more from making smaller things mm-hmm. or bigger things. Yeah. Now maybe I I want to move to like you know working with sculptures as well okay. alongside yeah. my paintings and I mean, my stuff. I've talked about how one of your recent shows uh, had a very small size 6x6 six six, right? Yeah, yeah. is it really like a box because mm-hmm. my canvases have a 3 inch border mm-hmm. so it literally looks like a little gift yeah. box so that's mm-hmm. also interesting. Mm-hmm. So it's like you you constantly keep like you know doing different things mm-hmm. and that also keeps refreshing your mind mm-hmm. keeps you inspired. So it's nice. And you said you like to keep constantly work. Is there a particular creative process that you have? Oh no way. Okay. It's like you can't. It's like I can't think like oh on a Tuesday I'm gonna be yeah. really inspired and start. Yeah. It it just comes naturally mm-hmm. to me. I sometimes I have this sketchbook and it's like if I have a dream mm-hmm. which I want to you know recreate, I open my phone and then my notes. I have like a whole yeah. notes like. paragraphs and paragraphs mm-hmm. of all these like thoughts and ideas very random thoughts yeah. and ideas and then i like put them in my sketchbook and then from my sketchbook i whenever i want mm-hmm. i just like put it in a painting okay. so it happens mm-hmm. very randomly sometimes i just don't feel inspired mm-hmm. sometimes i feel a bit too inspired too mm-hmm. overwhelmed or maybe if i go through some experience or something mm-hmm. then it anything can trigger mm-hmm. it it's like it comes without warning but that's that's yeah. a really nice thing as well but yeah that's that's what i love it's like it comes and it stays then it goes but then comes back mm-hmm. it's like this wave of like fresh air yeah and yeah. a number of artists for example they derive 
their in their inspirations from a number of places from music from movies from yeah. real life events so uh are they any, is there anything in particular that really inspires you i haven't thought about it like directly mm-hmm. but i know everything around me True, yeah. like literally the music i love listening to classical rock music okay, yeah. and you know like with classical rock it's like timeless music mm-hmm. the lyrics have so much meaning to yeah. them and all depth is while yeah. yeah yeah and it's like you know that's like my genre of choice to mm-hmm. listen to when i paint yeah. and i feel like you know some of my paintings also they're mm-hmm. like you know they're they're inspired by some of the lyrics yeah. of these songs mm-hmm. and also like movies books everything around me but not consciously like yeah. none of this is conscious mm-hmm. so it's like i can't really pinpoint which particular song yeah. or which mm-hmm. particular movie or which particular mm-hmm. um place or whatever it just happens so randomly with me it's just like um when i get inspired and start painting mm-hmm. and this is something my family and my friends have noticed mm-hmm. even my friends in thesis they noticed that i would just be very zoned out and mm. like you know sometimes in thesis like people would be trying to talk to me and i wouldn't even hear them mm. and i would just be like staring at my work mm. and then i'd like put some strokes mm. or i'd be standing on a chair and like painting the top yeah so it's like i'm just taken to a completely different world yeah. and it's like i don't realize i then i look at the time and it's like the sun is coming mm-hmm. up and i'm like oh my god i was painting for 8 hours straight mm. i didn't even realize i yeah. didn't even eat like i yeah. can't eat when i work mm. i just drink a lot of water yeah so it's just very strange it's like i just go into another world and yeah. i don't notice these things it just happens yeah and people just observe me and they're like you look insane <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and before we go uh, people who want to buy your art uh, is there a particular way they can purchase it uh, i know there are certain galleries that you sell through but you also sell directly no okay and what galleries in for people in karachi especially because we know you're having a show in islamabad right now but people in karachi or lahore how can they are there specific galleries that they can go to uh in karachi and lahore so in karachi um i work pretty often with coil gallery yeah. and canvas gallery mm-hmm. and in lahore i work with oat space so okay. these yeah. are like the places mm-hmm. like i work with and i feel comfortable and mm-hmm. i built a bond with them mm-hmm. so it's nice yeah. yeah thank you so much for your time tejja it was lovely having you we spoke about art we spoke about creative process we spoke about channeling your trauma into art and lots more until next time keep watching